Hey, good morning, fellowship, family, community, friends. So glad you have chosen to, well, worship with us this morning. Grab your Bibles, fire up your devices. We're in Romans chapter 13, verse 8 to the end of the book. If you want to follow along with your notes, they're available on the app. Go ahead and pull those up right now, and we're going to get started. You know, I have been struck the past few weeks by the slower pace of life, and well, uh, this idea of, well, slowness through this thing called the great pause, I guess you would call it, and just, well, how fast so many of us were running before. And so it's really no surprise that we have been distracted as Christians from the most important things. I've heard this said over and over and over again. I didn't realize how much I was missing out on. I didn't realize how much I really longed for this slower pace, family time, dinners, whatever it may be. I mean, we've kept dizzying schedules. So many of us have deprived ourselves of sleep just to keep up. And well, for so many in our culture, we have nearly forgotten what really matters. Hey, could it be God is using all of this as a wake-up call? Well, I think the answer is yes. Don't let it zip by you. Don't simply binge watch Netflix through this. Let Jesus speak to you and transform you. Allow him to speak to that innermost recesses of your heart and soul. And may he revive you and revive his church which would spark a great awakening across our land and across our globe. Really, as we come to Romans, Paul's readers must have felt much the same pressure in first century Rome. It was the center of Western civilization. Things were at a fast pace just to keep up there. And now for the church in Rome, their great temptation was to withdraw from involvement with politics. After all, why waste time with a government? When the Lord Jesus is going to come back and, well, squash it. So I'm sure they saw a little interest in need of interacting with their non-Christian neighbors whose anti-Christian and anti-Jewish sentiments were growing. And many of them, well, they felt like life on earth was short. Surely Christ would be returning soon. He had promised to return at any moment, establish his kingdom. So Paul tackles this idea head on. And my friends, this is what I want us to hear, is it is time for the Christ follower to truly follow Christ, to wake up and well serve him and his purposes and be on mission for what he has called his church to do. We have been distracted long enough. Let's go to Romans chapter 13, if you would, read with me verse 8 to the end of the book. Paul says, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone. The day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Pray with me. Father in heaven, bless the reading of your word. Help us to understand it. Awaken our hearts here in this moment. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I've got one relationship and one responsibility for every believer that I want us to glean from this passage. One relationship and one responsibility. Here it is. Number one, what does my relationship with those outside the church look like? What is your relationship supposed to look like with those individuals that are with outside of our church, those that are unbelievers? It's simply right there in your notes, owe nothing to anyone. Now, the command to owe nothing to anyone, notice now the context is, is broader than money. 
In verse 7, look at it again. Do you see it there what it says in verse 7? Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, do you see it? Did you notice it there? We, we owe government officials money. That's taxes. We owe them respect. That's fear and honor. The command to avoid owing anything extends beyond money to include intangible things. There's only one exception, and it's love. So Paul's point is simple here, my friends. Paul is saying, look at it there in your notes. Paul is saying, be a person of honor. Fulfill your obligations. Give respect when it's due. Pay what you owe. You make a promise, you keep it. That's what Paul's saying. And there is a reward for this, according to Paul. The reward for this style of living is freedom. Kind of interesting, isn't it? One of our famous financial experts in our country talks about having financial freedom. And well, this would definitely uh, suffice that. But there is a freedom of life when we live according to the scriptures. You are never more free to live your life than when you're following, well, the mandates and the commands of Scripture when you're looking like Jesus. You see, the less you must do out of obligation, the more you're able to give freely. Keeping your list short of obligations, well, it allows you more room to give grace. So here we are in this thing that has been dubbed the great pause. This is one thing every one of us should be learning right now during this time. We should be learning to keep our obligations short. So many of us have had additional time for family dinners each evening, game nights regularly, long conversations with friends and family and spouse. So the command to love one another goes beyond merely loving other Christians, though. It's one thing as a believer to love another believer, but it's another thing entirely for you as a believer to love those outside of the faith. Did you notice there? Look at what it says in verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. And so you, as a believer, you love one another. We talk about that a lot here at the fellowship. We love one another. We demonstrate we are his to an unbelieving world by how we care for one another, by how we bear burdens and pray for one another, right? But there's another aspect to this. It is loving your neighbor. Now, that word neighbor is a specific word in the original language. It's in your notes there. Let's define it. I want you to understand this. Neighbor is one of a different kind. That is the meaning of this word. It's one of a different kind. It means we are, yeah, to love believers, of course. That's what we do as believers. We, we love those that like, are like us. We love those that sit in the pew next to us that are in our Sunday school class. Or, well, now they're on our Zoom class. But at the exact same time, we love those that are different. What does that mean? Different in tastes. Different in race, different in values, different in history, different in religion. Listen, we do all of this with love. Difference, listen my friends, difference should make no difference for the believer. This is a perpetual debt that can never be zeroed out. It can never be paid off. Look at verse 9. Look at what it says here. Check it out with me. Do you see it there? For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Now Paul called love the fulfillment of the law. Of the law. And what he's doing here, he's recalling the teaching of Jesus. If you go back to Matthew, this is what Jesus taught. He says this one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The law is not only an expression of God's character, it points to his original created order. It points to his vision for how the universe should work. But sin, right? Sin always distorts. What God created to be good, well, sin always causes harm. Understand this. Sin and love cannot coexist. You see that bumper sticker or the banner in certain places. And well, it has this idea that this is the loving thing to do, to coexist. Sin and love cannot coexist. Love doesn't commit or condone adultery. Love cannot murder. Love doesn't steal from another. Love cannot lust after another person's stuff. Those are all actions that serve self, and they're always at the expense of the victim. Think about it for a moment. You take something from someone, it hurts them. And listen, rest assured, there is no such thing as a victimless sin. There's always a victim. Sometimes it's you, but there's always a victim. Look at your notes there. What's Paul getting at? For Paul, love embodies the highest ideals of the new kingdom. Think about that statement for a moment. Let's be critical thinkers of the scriptures. For Paul, the apostle who wrote an, an enormous amount of the New Testament, for him, love embodies the highest, the greatest ideal of the new kingdom. Now, this new kingdom that Jesus will establish and enforce upon his return to earth, where God's original created order is going to be restored. Now, in the meantime, the apostle desires that all believers become living examples of this new kingdom. So, although we're in this already not yet aspect of the kingdom We're awaiting him to come and to bring it into its fulfillment. We are to reflect. We are to highlight and demonstrate, well, what a citizen of the kingdom of Jesus looks like. It's just like back in the beginning, way, 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 way back before the fall. You are to be righteous because he is righteous, You are to love one another because God is love. You are to live according to the truth because God is truth. You are to be transformed to fulfill God's original vision for creation. And the world, my friends, listen, the world should be transformed even a little because of your influence. It's like we say often around here, when there is a large gathering of transformed believers and how to change our community and how to change our families and our workplace, even if it is just a little. Which brings me to that second statement I made at the beginning. What is my responsibility and what does my responsibility as an ambassador of Christ look like? Summed up in one word. Your responsibility as an ambassador of the high king on the great throne on this planet is love. Now, look at verse 11 with me for a moment. Do you see it? Do this. Now, it's urgent. Do you see it? It's like, do this. Get with it now. This is urgent that you understand what I'm saying and you take part now. Look at it. Verse 11. Do this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. Now, did you pick up on that urgency of Paul's words? It's as though he's sounding the trumpet or the conch shell. Maybe you saw Tom Brady's tweet, a little video this week. He's standing in the woods and he picks up this shell and he begins to blow it. And out of nowhere, here comes the great Gronkowski running up to him And simply leaning down out of breath, he says, Gronk reporting for duty. That is the call that we see right here of Paul to the believer. 
just like that, we are to rise up and get busy because of the time. Now, the word Paul uses here is a time or season. It's that word kairos. It is a specific word, not a chronological time, but an appointed time, an appointed season, an era. Paul is essentially saying this, my friends. You must get this. Do this. What's this? What I'm talking about here. What Paul is teaching, Paul says, do this. Live this way because you understand the time in which you live. What do we do? We love. Hey, look around. The season is closer than it's ever been for the return of Christ. It could happen at any moment. What does Jesus say? When you see these signs, what are the signs? Wars and rumors of wars, pestilences. Ears are up now, aren't they? Earthquakes and tsunamis and fires and volcanic activity. What do we do? He says, look up for your salvation is near. My friends, we don't know the time nor the hour, but we are closer than we've ever been before. And so because we can see the era or the season that we are in, we need to do this. It's more important than ever that we wake up as the church, that we pray for an awakening with our own hearts and with our own congregation, that it would just have a ripple effects across the church in America and across the globe, the time is drawing near. Look at it. Are you ready? Do you know him? Are you living for him? How do we live for him right now? Love. But how, pastor? How do we demonstrate love, Pastor Chris? What does it even look like for us? I've been running so fast and so hard chasing so many things that if I were to be honest, well, the things of God have always been pushed off to the side. That would be the refrain of so many in the American church. But through this great pause, I hope and pray he's awakening you to something greater and better because the time is drawing near. So how do you demonstrate love? Look at your notes there. You maintain a balanced view of yourself. You maintain a balanced view of yourself. Going back to chapter 12, verse 3, that's what Paul teaches, if you recall, in that message a few weeks ago. How do we demonstrate love? We utilize our gifts for the good of the body. We are engaged in the local church. The local church is, well, uh, God's gift to his son for his glory. And in some regards, it is the son's gift to us as we do life together and get to glorify him through the body. We learn that in 12 verses 4 through 8. How do we demonstrate love? You outdo other believers in showing honor to one another. You want to be in a contest? Outdo one another in showing honor to one another. We learn that in chapter 12 verses 9 through 14. Return good for evil and leave room for the Holy Spirit to convict. We learned that back in 12, 17 through 21. Meet all your obligations to the government and give them proper respect. We learned that last week. And as we do these, oh man, as we do these, it gets exciting because we begin to create a, a foundation of love on which you can build relationships and hopefully extend the new kingdom. What I mean by extend is bring more people into the new kingdom because of the way you're living your life. So many of you are already doing this. It's been tremendous to hear the stories of transformation because God has used you. Paul describes our time as one in which salvation is closer to arriving than ever before. Did you catch that there in the notes? Did you see it there in the passage? Look at it. Do this, verse 11, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. Now, he's not talking about our personal salvation. For those of us in Christ, that has already happened. That has been in the past. Paul is referring to the return of Christ and the restoration of God's righteousness as the master plan of salvation. 
And because it's closer than before and could occur at any moment, you cannot afford to be found sleeping right now. You need to be awake. You need to be alert. You need to be living in eager anticipation of that day. It could happen at any moment. Look at verse 12. Do you see it there with me? The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lusts. And so now Paul, after having said do this with great urgency because the return of Christ is so imminent, he gives this illustration of night and morning, a a dramatic turn. Did you see it there? Look at it again. Look at what he does. Look at how he says this. The night is almost gone and the day is near. And so as this long, dark night continues before the dawning of Christ's return, he says some believers are sleeping. My friend, could that be you? Have you been the Christian who's been asleep? It's time to wake up. Paul begins to list them. Did you catch it? Look at it. Here's what he says. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, Not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality. Not in strife and jealousy. Have you been a believer who's dabbled in these things? Maybe it hasn't been overt. But by the things you watch on TV or take part in on the internet or jokes. You've allowed the flesh to fulfill its lusts. This is a wake-up call from the Apostle Paul. If the Spirit of God is speaking to you right now, my friend, repent. This is the goodness of our God. Grace. Something great you and I don't deserve. We're told by the Apostle John in his epistle, uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us, purify us of all unrighteousness. Right now, if the Spirit of God is speaking to you in this regard, if you've been the believer who's been asleep, it's time to be revived and awakened. Repent. Right there in the quietness of your home, wherever you are, simply call out to him through prayer and ask him to forgive you and claim that promise in 1 John 1, 9. Use this time, use this message as a wake-up call to get right with him. Now let's wrap up. Look at verse 14. But, but what? Instead of doing all that stuff, instead of living fleshly, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Now the word for but, that uh, beginning word there, is a special one, and it's used to draw a stark contrast. This is the one Paul uses. It's the word Allah. It, it's absolute and unequivocal in its contrast to the deeds of darkness that uh, opposed to those that are in the light. You see, we have been given the armor of light. We are to put on or clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, the new self, the armor of God. Have you ever noticed clothes do make you feel good? In Paul's day, depending on what you wore, showed who you were and the standing in which you had in the community. And really, even today, in some regards, it does. You put on a nice uh, set of clothes that are clean and crisp and stylish. You just feel more confident. You just feel a bit, well, uh, more bold. In many ways, clothes do make the man gives you the confidence. So to put on something is 
to believe a certain way and then behave according, accordingly. Putting on Christ, I mean, it sounds artificial, like you're, you're putting on airs, you're making something up, but it's not, my friends. Look at your notes there. We put on Christ to display our true identity as Christ followers. When, when we put Jesus on, you see, what we put on reminds us of who we are, which allows us to behave properly. You have police officers. They put on their uniform with their bulletproof vest, and it reminds them to, well, uh, to be cautious and to take safety at a, at a high level. They put on their badge, and it reminds them that they are the law, and they are there to serve and to protect and to serve the, the neighborhoods. They, uh, they put on their gun, and it reminds them that, well, uh, they need to uh, uh, uphold the law and to stand for truth and righteousness. You see, that officer puts on his uniform, and it makes the man, right? It, it shows him who he is, and it shows all of us who he is. And so when we put on Christ, it reminds us of who we are, and it shows those around us whose we are. Now, the other side of Paul's argument, or I guess you could say command, is to make no provision for the flesh. Remember, that is our old enslavement to sin, and so we need to plan ahead to make it inconvenience to sin. We don't, we don't let it have a place in our lives. And so as I read Paul's writing to pursue love and avoid evil, I, I'm emboldened by the urgency of his tone here and his insistence that you and I take immediate and decisive action. This is what he calls putting on Christ. It's interesting. Have you ever thought about it this way? You love others by avoiding sin. Because remember, there's no victimless sin. And so what do you do? You look for opportunities to do good. That's our live to bless philosophy. You see a need, you fill it. Now the world's gonna make this hard for you. You're gonna have plenty of temptations and traps to, uh, well, fall prey to. And instead of complaining about all the temptations and the traps that are set before you, think about every obstacle as an opportunity to honor Christ. And so that means we leave nothing to chance. No, not for the believer. We leave nothing to chance. What do I mean? TV's a temptation for you. It's a temptation to look at things you shouldn't look at or to spend, well, inordinate amounts of time whittling away the days. Well, cancel your cable or put on restrictions. If the internet is a temptation that will take you where no mind should go, whether it's social media porn or simply hours of unproductivity, well, set limits, use a filter, ha have accountability partners, only put the computer in a public room, like in our house, we have no screens in the bedrooms, everything's done out in public where all can see and hear, we make no provision for the flesh, but there's so, so much more than just avoiding temptation. We put a plan into place to avoid temptation, but we also look for opportunities to grow spiritually. What are the opportunities that are before you to grow spiritually? Well, obviously logging on and watching a service like this, being encouraged by the worship and prayer and studying his word, applying it practically. Logging into one of our Sunday school Zoom classes. And well, the reason they existed in part is discipleship. If you're interested, well, right now, text Jesus to the number on the screen right here, and we will get you plugged into one of those classes. Maybe you want to be involved in one of our women's or men's online Bible studies. We've got two great opportunities uh, for uh, our women's class. They've got several opportunities, and we have our men's class on Thursday evenings. Or maybe you want to build a relationship, even if it is over a screen. Plug into our one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Plug into that one-on-one -on -one relationship as you begin to work through the scriptures. You see, living free like this is only possible because of the work of the cross. It's all because of Christ. We can live totally free in surrendered service to him, and there's no freedom like that. Maybe you say, you know, pastor, I, I want that sort of life. 
Well, the scriptures say it's available to all who will believe. Here's what you need to hear and understand is God loves you. Oh, my friend, God loves you so very much, in fact, that he created you on purpose and for a great purpose. That purpose is to live in a right relationship with your creator by putting your faith and your trust in his son, Jesus, and his work on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, it went down like this. God looks down upon this world, and he sees our greatest need. We need to be saved from our sins. And so at just the right time in human history, he sent Jesus, the divine one, God in the flesh, to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, to go to the cross and give his body a sacrifice and his blood to cleanse the world of sin. He died, was buried, and three days later, oh, he rose from the dead, proving he is divine. He is God in the flesh, and he's defeated death and sin in the grave. And if you put your faith and trust in him and his work on the cross, your sins will be forgiven. That means your sins, everything you've ever done wrong, forgiven, washed away, your past, canceled out, your shame, your guilt, gone. Is that something that you would like to take part in? Here's the good news. Not only will he give you freedom to live your life now and will be able to live purposefully today, but when Christ returns, you'll be ready. You say, Pastor, that's what I want. Well, I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment. And wherever you are, you can pray this prayer. And if you uh, pray this prayer in faith, well, I believe the Bible will do what Jesus says he'll do. That he will save you. Here's what Paul says. If you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So my friend, here you go. I'm going to pray right now. Bow your heads wherever you are and simply pray a prayer like this in faith. I will lead you. Dear God, I confess with my mouth that you are the Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and be my Savior. Transform me in Jesus' name. Hey, and if you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, we want to know about it. First off, we want to celebrate with you, and we want to, well, rejoice with you, and we also want to send you a free gift. We want to send you some materials that will help you understand a bit more in depth about the decision you've just made. Help you answer some questions, like what does it mean that I've trusted Christ as Savior? What does it mean to have eternal life? What does it mean my sins are forgiven? How do I begin to live on purpose and for great purpose? But we want to help you with that. So right now, text Jesus to that number on the screen or call the phone number. And one of our pastoral staff members would love to talk with you and help you and pray with you in any any regard possible. If that's you, go ahead and do it right now. Our team's standing by. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to be dismissed. Father in heaven, we love you. I pray for those individuals that have trusted you as Savior. Give them the courage to reach out. Help them to grow in their faith and be with every one of us listening, that we might have, well, the strength, the muscles on the inside by the Holy Spirit of God to live out these truths and to love. In Jesus' name, amen.